We exposing thug mentality. Hey, yo, what's up, man? Did you get the book? The book? What book? Man, go to thugexposed.com and get the book, Thug Mentality Exposed, by author Rayford Johnson. Thug Exposed? Yeah, man. The book is deep and very informative of the occultic movement called thug mentality. Say what? Yeah. Man, for instance, uh-huh. did you know that sagging pants started in prison what? as male prostitution? Oh, man, let me pull my pants out. Mama, where my belt at? <laughs> you crazy. Hey, listen to this. The author's written facts is ancient spiritual history dating all the way back to ancient Babylon. Whoa, I gotta get that book, man. Man, what you say that was? Go to thugexposed.com uh-huh. or call 1-866-909-BOOK. Representing truth. Okay. So get with the new movement. Oh, for sure. At thugexposed.com. We exposing thug mentality. See, every sister days in Adam and Eve. Sins growing more and more, leaving folks shattered and grieved. See, the devil want to scatter and deceive. And God's no love. He'll leave you battered to bleed. Every day getting sadder, we need the love of Jesus Christ instead of another platter of weed. I pray the Lord has mercy on my soul. Sometimes I find me climbing up the ladder of greed. Trying to get my screw right, but the Lord said I'll be more blessed if I go ahead and scatter my seed. So I'm trying to do everything. Hello, he I'm Randall Lippins. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I'm a uh, member of thuggexposed.org. We're going to be doing an interview today with a gentleman who has a background in Satanism and being a vampire. And we're going to talk to him a little bit. I want you to, inter- if you would, introduce yourself. My name is Obed Mungalo. I've been involved for a while, about five years recently, and uh, the Lord brought me out. I was involved in Satanism and in vampirism, and I've sadly been deeply involved in it, so I'm going to be talking about that. The Lord brought me out, and now I'm preparing to become a missionary pastor, and today's interview will be about that. Okay. Can you give us a little bit of, of your background? What brought you into Satanism? And and uh, you can talk a little bit more later about becoming a vampire, but you were saying that Satanism, was that something that your family was a part of, or how did you get introduced to that? Uh, in my family, it runs generationally. I've been, uh, on my, in my case, I'm the firstborn of my mother and my father, and that runs down the lines. It's a generational thing. In my case, there was something placed inside of me when I was a child, and uh, probably around my first year of life, actually. And then it's a spirit that gets passed down generationally from one child to another, to another, and to another. And in my case, it's been with me since I was a child, and that has caused a gravitation towards the enemy, Satan, Lucifer, and that's what brought me into it. At the age of seven, I became a believer. I believed in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I legitimately and with all my heart came to know Christ, and this thing that was inside of me fell asleep. And then as time passed, it was asleep, I started following God fully. I didn't know why, I just needed to. I I had to. I felt that if I didn't do this, I was going to drown. At the age of 13, more or less, 12, 13, is when I was baptized with the Holy Spirit, and then the Lord started revealing things to me. I served the Lord fully. I gave Him everything, my heart, my soul. I honestly don't think any of the other youth around me at the time were as given to God. They would make fun of me, they would they would make fun as to why I focused more on God than even girls or you know as, as you become a preteen you start getting that. Your hormones start flaring, you start going into your teenage years and around the age of 18, a little bit before that in my late teens is when I started dabbling a little bit in a Satanism I started dabbling it into the field of parapsychology, started studying mind control, how did that happen? Because 
Before I became a believer, I started developing abilities, but they were innate. They were part of me. It's like if something inside of me started springing out. On retrospect, when I look back, I realized that it was the spirit that was inside of me. It was that spirit that was granting me that. At the time, I didn't know. I thought it was part of my soul. I sincerely thought it was a second half to my soul. So when I reached my late teens, I started dabbling in it. And at that time, I left the church I was in. I was in a Baptist church and I left. I was curious to know more about this. I started finding out more about my family. My grandmother started telling me more. She started telling me what they about a little bit about this and that. You know that we are, you know, we're Ramirez. We are a very proud family, and that there is a strong occultic ties in our family. So I started dabbling in it. I started developing abilities and. At the time that I moved to Richmond, a few years later, I had something happen to me. It was a stroke, uh, what, aneurysm. I'm yeah. sorry, but what type of abilities do you mean when you say you started developing abilities? I could control things with my mind. I could move things. I believe it's called micro telekinesis, bordering on macro, which is uh, using the mind, the willpower, to make something move. It is using this connection to the spirit body to move things. And then another thing I developed was the ability to read or to hear superficial thoughts on a person. I couldn't hear what was in the deepest thoughts, just what they would broadcast out. Like, oh, I need to go do the laundry. I need to wash my car, things like that. If I focused and the person opened up, I could listen to more. I also developed an extension of telekinesis called pyrokinesis, which is control of mind over fire. Where uh, the training I would do would be to have a candle in front of me and then I would try to bend the fire with my mind. And how I would do it is that I would relax and just become the flame and then the flame would move as I willed it. And uh, I had another ability, which was the ability to touch and to create impulses in a female to make her want me. That was an offshoot of mind control. Those are pretty much the abilities I had. Mm. Okay, now you said something a while back mm -hmm. about your grandmother laying hands on you as a child to pass yes. that spirit into you. She told my uh, father and my mother that she was imparting a blessing upon me as her grandson. And yes, that's how you transfer it. You pass it on through a laying of hands. It's something that mimics the laying of hands to transfer the Holy Spirit, so to speak. It's something made to mimic it like that. And yes, that's how it passed it on to me. Uh, some of the other details are obscure, but, I, but from what I've been able to find out is that there also had to be a blood, something that has to do with a blood where they would take a sample of my blood as well, and they would use that. I'm not really sure on that, and she didn't ever tell me about that. What I do know is about the laying of hands, because that is what passes it on. And once it's passed on, according to tradition, I'm supposed to lay my hands on my firstborn, which obviously I won't do, and the ties have been broken, thanks to the Lord, that that has been done. But it's passed on like that. Yeah. Amen. And, uh... Another question that we had, uh, we talked about the popularity of Twilight and also Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people think that those are harmless uh, TV programs and films. Uh, what is your opinion on those type of programs? Do they draw people into the occult or is this something that many Christians are just uh, being too sensational about when they say that you know these things are drawing people into witchcraft. Personally, I don't think that radical Christianity, as it's called, being radical, sensational, is really that off because the Bible teaches us that we have to be set apart. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and get to that. The thing about Harry Potter, Twilight, is that there is a strong demonic, there is a strong occultic tie into all of this. Uh, as I've mentioned before, uh, the, 
there is a very big net. There is this whole occultic net or dragnet that they're all interwined. And they serve Lucifer, they serve Satan under different names. Now as far as Twilight, it is based on the vampire mythos. And in my personal case, I've been involved in that. And there are gothics and fake vampires and there are those who surrender themselves to spirits and the spirits make changes and it can be downright disturbing like things like their teeth can grow their their body can sort of metamorph they can't do anything that's too far off but they can do things like that and that's all from the demonic realm there is nothing that is natural about this and what Twilight does is it takes this it creates a film out of this and there is a deep demonic occultic backing into this there is a desire to turn away the young people away from God to weaken the discernment and their spiritual awareness there is a very real threat they pray over this they fast over this there is a strong satanic commitment to use this to destroy the churches and to enslave souls into this subculture because now the vampire is no longer menacing it's no longer evil there to be to be loved to a certain extent to have compassion over them that they're almost normal sad people and while it doesn't say that vampires are real because that's something that's been hidden from a lot of people there is this whole almost preparation that as we come to the end times and they start kind of emerging more and more from the hidden light then it's almost normal and it's okay in fact it's just an alternative lifestyle that is allowable and as far as Harry Potter, Harry Potter deals deeply with the demonic. There is no such thing as godly magic. There is no white magic in itself. White magic, red, green, black, they're all the same thing. It all comes from the demonic realm. The Bible, in fact, talks about this, that these soothsayers, that those who practice necromancy or speaking to the dead, these are things that were abominable, and they are abominable in the eyes of God. And what Harry Potter does is that it brings it out like if it's okay, like if it's normal. And we have a lot of young people who all of a sudden now are getting this desire to look into the occult. You know, you, you got things like Magic the Gathering, you got things like like Pokemon, Harry Potter, you got the you got the magician's nephew or assistant. I know there's a series that's about the magician as well. And you got so many different things that are now focusing on the occult. And Harry Potter, Twilight are two of the bigger names. Then you got things like Lord of the Rings that that speaks about Middle Earth and this magical set of different races, the elves, the dwarves, the you got these uh, these hobbits and all of these different things, but they deal with magic as well. They deal in this fantasy land, which if you study and you know about the satanic realm, the demonic realm, and also how Satanism has influenced our lifestyle here in the West and how deeply it's become involved here. And if you really search it out, which you'll find some things that are very disturbing is that there are humans that have surrendered themselves to the devil and they get changed and they look like these things, these things out of myth. And it, and it is real. The, the, mm. the enemy's realm is real and it is here on earth. It's, the enemy controls this earth in so many ways and a lot of it is because we as people have allowed it. We as Christians have kind of taken a back road because we don't want to believe in it. We don't want this war. We want to just be comfortable, be in our comfort zones and we don't stand up to this. Here's the reality. The enemy has people and Satanists pray, they fast, they make war against the believers. And you said that even in uh, mm -hmm. the satanic church, they send out Satanists and warlocks on assignment to churches. Yeah. You know, here even in Sacramento, can you explain a little bit about that? Yes. And the uh, thing is this, is that churches, strong churches, are a threat to the enemy. As long as there are churches that promote seeking God out, being like the Bereans in the Bible that they would they would test every spirit, they would read the scriptures and check even what the apostles said 
compared to scriptures, then these Christians who follow this, who are learning this, are a threat. But when you have Satanists being sent out, which they get sent out on a regular basis, they weaken the churches, they dull it, they help promote doctrines that weaken the church, they, they counter prayer, they come in and fast and pray to dull the pastor's awareness. And a lot of times this is revealed from pastors, from bishops, from elders, and they don't know this. They're not aware that in most churches, and I would say a good 99.99% .99 of them already have had people infiltrate them. Satanists get sent out, specifically theistic Satanists. They get sent out to break, to destroy, to create oppression, to enslave and chain. They get sent out to destroy the foundations of what makes a church a church, and that is the tie to Christ that the believers have. They are sent in to, to create this lukewarm mentality that makes the Christian fall asleep. And there is an analogy is that how do you cook a frog? Well, you put the frog in water and you slowly raise it one, Fahrenheit, one degree of Fahrenheit by a degree by a degree. And the frog never realizes when it gets cooked and dies. And that's exactly what's happening now. And I personally have been sent on some of these assignments before. And it is very real and it deals with the demonic. And there is a call and a push to destroy. It's an active work and it's happening even now. So these could be your praise and worship leaders and choir, yes. um, readers. Mm -hmm. Wow. They could, they could be the prophet in the church, they could be the elders, they could be the very pastor himself, it could be the ushers, it could be anyone in the church. In fact, uh, one time I was in a church, and this is recently, this is having already come back to the Lord, and, and as I was coming in, I, I could, because of my background, I have a higher awareness of the darkness that's there, because I've been there, I recognize it a lot easier. And I was in the church and it was like the darkness, those who followed the enemy just stood up like beacons of darkness. And they would, and you would see, and if you looked into the spirit realm, you would see, and they would be there. And they were among the most holy, the most giving, they would, they would be the first at, first their church, they would be the earliest, they would be the ones who are tithing, they would be the ones who are even leading the prayer. And you would wonder, why would they lead in prayer? Well, if you've got someone who's leading in prayer, they can control it, they can twist it, they can, they can even give new meaning to words. And if the believer is not discerning, they will fall. Now let's talk about a little bit about the vampire community here in Sacramento. Yeah. Okay. What does that look like? Uh, you, it's you, very you diverse. It's Midtown. We're over yeah. here downtown right now. But you said it's real prevalent Midtown Sacramento. Yes. There is a, there's an entire house. There is an entire group of them, big. Now, some of them will argue, in fact, they go into the media and they call themselves other kin. They call themselves just people who are people who, who want to feel the energies and to feed off the energies. But there is more to this than that. There is a very real threat. There is a spiritual threat that undermines the Christian churches. They are not just another small group. The thing is, this is what they stand for, what they do. Some of them are just wannabes per se. Some of them are just there to have friends. Others are not. Others are in it at a very spiritual level. They drink blood for a reason. They feed on the life force in the blood. Uh, they, they have spread out. There is something called house here in Sacramento and uh, it's called House Lost Haven and there are other houses throughout all the United States and some of them go into Europe and they just start spreading out and they do a couple of things to battle the Christians they they uh, they say that those of us who do expose this who do talk about it are nothing more than radicals we're fundamentalists we're completely intolerant and that's the word they like to use is intolerant and they always say oh Christians are welcome in fact some of our members are Christians 
Well, I'm going to go ahead and, and I'm not, I don't need to go out on a limb on this one, is that any believer, any true Christian who is involved in blood drinking and energy feeding is not of God. The Bible teaches that you are not supposed to partake of the blood. In fact, you're not supposed to eat the blood. And any believer who does this, and this is New Testament we're talking about. This is the apostles giving that direction. You can't do that. This is against God. The, the life of a person is in the blood. We're not supposed to partake of it. This is anti-biblical. Any believer who endorses or follows either the vampiric lifestyle or is lenient towards it is not obeying the will of God. This is demonic. I don't see a middle ground here. There is no gray area. A true believer is not going to accept this. And they claim that it's okay, that there's no problem, that it's a normal thing. We're just a little bit different. They, they say they're just a little bit uh, set apart. In fact, some of them think they're the next evolution of okay. mankind. How did you get involved in the vampire culture? What brought you into it? It seemed one of the things that is uh, curious to me is like you're talking about Harry Potter and Twilight, how much the youth is uh, interested and gets involved in this. Is there a strong draw for the youth towards the vampire community? I mean, what's what's pulling? What pulls you, and what's pulling our youth into that uh, that environment? In my case, what happened was that at my uh, later teens, uh, well, early teens, mid teens, around 14, 15, when I was hitting puberty, I started getting a warrant in my body because I had something called the awakening. This is when the thirst or the need to feed starts becoming prevalent in your body. In my case, I started getting thirsty. I didn't really know what the thirst was until I tasted blood. Then I realized what it was. I started searching it out. I really didn't have much knowledge about vampirism or vampires before it. With me, I started seeking it out because I was, I was surprised about this. I was, I was stunned to have this need, this craving, and then tasting the blood. Uh, it, the feeling, I cannot describe it, what it feels like when you, when you partake of the blood and you feel its life force coming into you, that person's life force ebbing into you and then gets transformed into your own. There is a very real feeling sensation. There is something very real and dark about it is that when you feed, and in my case, that's how I first became involved. And then I started dabbling into the occult because there's this whole door that just opened up for me and I had been battling it through my mid-teens all the way into my late teens, I started battling it. The Holy Spirit in my, in my body was battling the very flesh and the, the other spirit that was in there. And the thing is that since this spirit was already in there and it had been so tied to my soul and nobody realized that it was a spirit, then it was never dealt with. And at the, at the best times, it would just fall asleep. Like if the Holy Spirit would go like, hey, that's enough, quiet, and that's it. But whenever I would open the doors, it would just start coming forth and they would create this need, this, this need. And I've been, in my background, I've been addicted to alcohol and even the addiction to alcohol or even weed doesn't compare to this. This is, this is somewhere at a higher level. It's like you feel it in your veins, you feel it in your body and even the, the very bones, you feel this. And I started getting involved in that way. I came back to the Lord and the thirst subsided. It would always edge. At, it would always be at the edges, right there, like it's, it's just waiting. I, uh, I fell again in my late, in my, not late 20s, mid, uh, early to mid 20s. And at that time, I dealt fully. I went full bore into it. I started partaking of the blood at a at a normal you know at a normal intervals this was when i was in richmond i became a martial arts instructor at the time and i went i even became a school manager a martial arts school manager and at the time i was partaking blood i was drinking blood i was well, getting what stronger what does that look like i mean people just come to a house uh, is it taken to people voluntarily or involuntarily what's going on with uh, this whole blood drinking culture 
Uh, when I was in Richmond, I had a uh, very different experience than over here. In Richmond, it would just be that I had donors, people who would come and they would, uh, they would, we would have like this agreement. They would give blood a certain amount per every two, three weeks, and then I would have another person who would do that. And they, well, what in their would they case, get out of that? Why would they do that? Honestly, I, I don't know. For me, all, all I cared about was me. Right. Uh, so they say some of them say that they get this energy off of it. That when they give that blood, they get this energy. They get this high off of it. Personally, I've never given, and I cannot, you know, vouch for that. They say that, and I'm sure there's a demonic tie in there as well. Because I don't see where giving blood in that way, in any way, shape, or form, benefits you. So were these givers, the people that were giving blood, donors, donors, yeah, were were they Satanists themselves? Or who so, were these people? Some of them are. Some of them are Satanists. Some are Wiccans. They come from a very diverse background. What ties them is that whole vampirism and the donor relationship. And. Uh, that was in Richmond, it was like that. I had my girlfriend and she would give me some of her blood as well. And then and then a couple of my other girlfriends because I was kind of uh, in a couple of different relationships at the same time. And then at the same time, I had, I was not very well acquainted or better say I was not in good standing with a couple of the vampires in that area because I was stronger than them. I had. I had my, the spirits that were inside of me were stronger than theirs and there was a lot of, a lot of fighting involved, a lot of hate, a lot of competition about who's stronger and who's more powerful. So I the didn't... more blood you would get, the stronger yes. you would become. So yep. you had a whole little network of blood coming to you. Mm -hmm. That's it. Now, when I came here, Sacramento, I realized that there was, it was way more organized. In fact, um, I was sought out. Once I came here, because I, ha I returned to the Lord in Richmond, and then that's how I ended up coming here. And then here, I was sought out. I mean, they searched me out of the house of this area. They searched me out. They checked my background, and then they confronted me. They're like, they told me, "You're you're this guy. You're 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 a vampire. We know your background. We know who you are. You're you're coming into our territory, and." We don't agree with that. You never asked for permission. You didn't. You're just coming in here, barging into our territory. So we need to we need to confront this. And there was uh, several meetings, and where we had a dialogue back and forth. And uh, I met with a couple of other vampires in this area as well. Who at the time I fell back, and we were going to start our own little coven. And the house was just like, no, you're not doing that. You, you, we, this is our territory. This is, this is Sacramento. This is our place. You, you're not doing that. And that's where my eyes were open to a bigger, a broader whole network where some of them even deal in a mafia type of life. Especially if you go towards LA and there had been a lot of talk about how some of the people that came from LA here were killed off and from here to LA were killed off. I really don't know the details on that, but there had been a lot of talk about that. And they were pretty open about not caring about that, only that because it's not something that's, you know, lawful, they then, you know, it, it's something that needed to be stopped. But there is a very big movement of the spiritual realm involved in all this. There is, it's huge. And this is just one network that in itself ties to other networks in the Luciferian light. Yeah, and in closing, we talked about music. And just briefly, can you tell us now, a lot of times we think of satanic music as rock and roll or rap. But I remember us having a conversation. You said even in jazz, yeah. even in classical <laughs> music. Uh, real briefly, can you tell us, you know, how? What, what's the mechanics of that in in the, in the demonic spirit realm? Well, a lot of uh, a lot of the music we listen to, especially secular. Secular is the big issue here. Is that they get prayed over. They, it's something that gets uh, it. They have spirits influencing them when they create the keys, when they create the chords, how it's going to tie in, how it's going to move. There's a huge amount of demonic activity involved creating music. Music is, in many ways, called the language of the soul, for a reason. And uh, a lot of people already know about the whole hard rock, metal. I mean, th 
but this goes deeper. I mean, if you listen to some dance, pop, even trance, trance, trance is extremely deadly because it's used to put you in an alternate state of consciousness, which when uh, the listener takes drugs, then they really just, it, it really opens you up. It, it opens like, up the spirit. Yeah. Classical can do that too. Uh, certain uh, certain songs that are classical are made to put you into this relaxed state where you can let go and open up and just be. And uh, if there's something I've learned from being involved in parapsychology and in the psychic phenomena is that when you blank your mind, someone's coming in. <laughs> there's going to be a demonic attack or there's going to be some kind of demonic oppression that's coming in because you, you open your mind, you're just there and you're basically just like leaving this huge door wide open and there will be something coming in and music goes hand in hand with drugs to do this. A lot of my experience with the music is that there is this strong demonic movement in there even in the notes from the chords to the notes and how it moves. A lot of a lot of people say, oh, it's just music. It's not just music. It's a medium. And every medium can be used to advance what's called the, the sinister dialectic or the, the dark principle it, to, to bring out this darkness and to open you up to the demonic realm, to the spiritual realm. And that's what music is for. And some of it is even more subvert than that. And it all points to the same thing. Just want to ask you, what what are you doing right now? And you're taking a trip trip to the Ukraine. You're going to be doing some outreach there. What, what's going on with you right now? Well, the uh, Lord has called me, and I'm going to be going to Ukraine. I'm going in September. I will be doing three months of study and then three months of field work. I will be in the city of Lutsk. It's a very interesting city. It's an industrialized city, but it's not gonna. It's not one of those big, you know, big towns like you know in San Francisco or anything like that. And I'm just going there to serve. I want to serve. It's what the Lord has called me to do, and I can. I'm gonna be there, moving as the Spirit moves me. If you know the Lord calls me back, I will be going back later on. I know that the Lord has this huge calling over there among the Slavic nations. There's a lot of orphans in need, and the Lord has this calling, and I'm going, and it's all for His glory. So, how can our audience reach out and uh, help you? Uh, you can go to thugexposed.org. You can go go look under staff, and I will be there. And any donations uh, will be appreciated. And um, you can also contact me. My contact info will be there. My phone number and any way you would like to contact, it will be appreciated and we'll all go for the glory of God. Right now I'm affiliated with the Church Ark of Salvation. It is a Slavic church and it's a missionary church as well. And all the contact info will be there. serve any other name yeah sure Mashiach. there's power in the name there's victory in the name there's healing in the name healing anointing in the name yes there is peace in the name if you would speak aloud Every knee.
Yeshua, we bless your name.